Live from Brooklyn, it's Monday night. <laughs> and I'd love to introduce the crew to you. So since I shook it up a little bit last week, we'll do it again this week. So I'm going to start off with Mr. John Tudor in Nashville, Tennessee. Hello there, everybody from Nashville. And then we have Michael and Dana down in um, um, Houston. Had a cold wave today. It went all the way down to 92. Mm. <laughs> you know, those, uh, tr those winter storms, they're just around the corner. And then we have Mr. Donald Cole. Just a second, Don. Let me get your pin or uh, spotlighted. There you go. Mr. Donald Culp. Hello, everybody. And of course, back to Brooklyn, where I'm still dodging bullets. And those car horns. Oh, oh well. Yana, would you like to open us up with a word of. Yes. Um, Father God, I just thank you for this wonderful evening and this wonderful day that you made for us. I thank you how well you take care of each and every one of us and bring us together with hearts knitted together, ready to receive and learn and live your word. Thank you for this special time with my brothers and sisters and everybody just having a really, really blessed time. Thank you for your mercy and and grace that is new each morning and how you shower your blessings upon your children thank you for your word that heals us and corrects us and shows us how to live and how to walk and talk as your beloved son did and does thank you so much lord jesus just for everything y'all are just totally amazing and we're just really honored to be loved by y'all thank you for making us a family thank you father god for anyone on here that needs healing or help i thank you for meeting their hearts desires father god for them and their loved ones and their families just love you so much in the name of jesus christ amen Amen. Amen. So, since we're over here, Mr. Michael, you want to start her, take her away? Absolutely. We're going to start off with, uh, we're not going to call it uh, the second half. And when I did the first mm -hmm. one, I said, we'll get back with the second half because it's going to be a little bit more than that as I study this thing more and more concerning sons of God. Uh, tonight I want to talk a little bit more about the nations of the world that uh, the word speaks to. I want to bring it to the Christian writings, some of the Christian writings, but I don't want to forget where we're coming from. I want to compare specifically three chapters uh, in the Word today, uh, two of them from the Hebrew writings and one of them from the Christian writings, to try to drive home uh, the more, uh, to broaden the scope, to bring to a, a bigger picture this idea of the sons of God. Last week we talked about the sons of God uh, from the Hebrew writings, the sons that were born in the beginning. <clears throat> some would say that they're uh, some of these protokos, uh, protokos uh, from the Greek is a, the first, the first in a line, the prototypes that were born. Jesus Christ is talked about as being a protokos, a first in a line. And uh, I also want to illustrate, because I thought about this today, and we're going to get to it sooner or later, that when we're talking about the sons of God in 
uh, that came out of the uh, Genesis 10, 11, and 12 thing when the nations were being separated, that the, the, those 70 sons that the nations were put under obviously aren't the only group of sons that the Bible talks about. You also have the incident in Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of daughter the, when the sons of God saw that the daughters of men uh, and they basically started messing with the genetic line. So this idea of sons of God uh, is not just limited to these 70 that we're speaking about. And, and we're going to get to some more of this in the future. But for right now, we're focusing on how the nations were divided up. Because even last week when we looked in Deuteronomy, we saw that the um, Israel was starting to worship other gods, and they were even bringing in gods that their fathers did not know that weren't there before. So it's not like you just had the seventy, and that's all. There's a there's a whole uh, array of sons of God that are mentioned in the Hebrew writings and different concepts. And as we brought up again last week, the idea of uh, whether it's angelic beings, uh, of course, when we call, when we see it evil, we call them demons or uh, uh, devils. Uh, but the idea that these that all these beings are always doing everything good or bad, uh, with the idea that they have freedom of will, is just not practical to communicate that because people get into this this idea they got the wonderful angel that's on this shoulder and the demon on this shoulder and they're whispering in your ear. That's not a very valid picture because these angelic beings are beings that have free will just like man. Now there are faithful, wonderful, even named uh, beings that uh, the prince uh, of Israel is Michael is called the Prince of Israel because of his faithfulness toward that nation and uh, uh, with his duty that God, God gave him. So there are wonderful, very faithful uh, angelic beings that are just more consistent uh, than others that are that are focused. Uh, also, there's a little bit of a higher standard, it seems to be, for the angels that do God's will, will bring God's word to, into fruition uh, during the Hebrew writings. They are, they are very, very, very focused on representing God to a very high standard in whatever situation that they've been given. And judges... The angel is coming around that uh, t that says that he's the same angel that took Israel out of Egypt, and and he uh, brings the point up that he, as long as they did what God commanded by that angelic being, that angel was with them. He was he was uh, he was a spokesperson for God, and he spoke for God, and he was with them. But as soon as they got out of line, I'm out of here. I'm getting out. The word's not here. Uh, the angelic beings generally aren't going to be around for very long either, unless God commands them to go and fight or something. But we see this, this idea throughout the writings. And most Christians read over the spiritual aspects. They, 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 don't have, they haven't been taught to have good constructs as far as a vision of exactly what the word is portraying so that they can get an idea that there is there is a heaven and there is an order there. We read a little bit of it in Daniel last week. Um, and that God wants you to see the way things work. He wants to give you pictures and the word most certainly does that. We just haven't been taught to read it from. We haven't been taught to read it, period. And, and with the idea of what those words that were originally written in that Eastern setting meant to those people and what they should mean to us in the same manner from uh, getting a vis visualization of what's going on, not only physically in this world, but the spiritual reality behind it. 
So we're going to look at this, uh, this word nations here a little bit uh, today. Uh, the word ethnos, which is uh, translated uh, in the Christian writings 163 times. Uh, 93 times it's translated Gentiles, uh, 30 times nations, nation, 37 times nations, one time pagan, and two times people. Uh, and and then it's, it's, it's translated in a very broad scope, and I think Strong does a pretty good deal with, with showing that. Uh, it says a definition as, is a race, a nation, which we're going to look at it from that standpoint more than any, uh, the nations as a district, uh, as distinct from Israel. So when, when we talk often in the Christian writings when they talk about all the other nations of the world, which there are many, and they knew that, they understood that, but they don't distinct it as other nations. That's why that translation Gentiles is so prevalent in there. You had the Jews, and you had the Gentiles. You had God's people, and you had the heathens, <laughs> the ones that were without God and without promise and um, separated from the covenants and promises of God. And so when we look at this, this word, we have to realize that. Uh, the Bible helps, uh, basically says, ethno, it comes from the word ethno, which means forming a custom or culture. Properly, people joined by practicing similar customs or common cultures, nation, nations, usually referring to unbelieving Gentiles or quote non-Jews. So when we look at when we look at this word nations in or Gentiles in the Christian writing, we have to realize it's talking about all the other groupings of people in the world. Now of course during the time of the first century church, a lot of those uh, the, the closest areas there were a lot of Greek speaking people. So we see the, the we see that Greek uh, uh, word used to express a specific nation. The Greek culture, of course, the Greek language was very prevalent at that time. So, uh, it's, but again, we got to see it now. The most another out of those 163 times that it's used, the majority of those usages are in the Book of Revelation, and eventually in this. Uh, particular uh, subject that we're covering, we're going to have to look into that book to see how this progresses in the future with the nations of the world With when the Lord Jesus Christ returns in all his power um, and basically is taking over the world because he is going to fight with the nations that are standing in opposition to him. It's going to be it's interesting because when he, when he returns for Israel, he's, because Israel is going to be made a great nation above all the other nations, the way God called them to be in the Hebrew writings, and they failed miserably under that covenant. But when they, when they are raised from the dead, they're going to, be empowered to become what God called them to be, to be a nation among the nations where all the other nations will flourish to know God. And that will be in that thousand-year millennial kingdom. Uh, but getting there, getting to that point, the, the time in between our time period, the administration of grace and the administration of the sacred secret, and the millennial time period, there is a small seven-year period of time, uh, which is called the time of the wrath of God, the tribulation period, uh, that seven-year period of time, somewhere between the rapture and the return of Jesus to the earth for the resurrection of the just and the sheep and goat judgment, that is a very tumultuous period of time. And when Jesus Christ returns, he is returning not only with all the 
uh, powers of God that are in the heavenlies now that will remain there because of their faithfulness that he's establishing. Quite frankly, we're going to look at that too in Hebrews. He's establishing now. But also his full body, the body of Christ, the group of people that are being called out from among all the nations of the world. It's, it's really kind of cool when you look at the scope of the overall situation and how wise God is, because nobody knew the sacred secret. Nobody knew that there would be neither Jew nor Gentile, but the church of God, that God was going to, after the resurrection of his son and his ascension, call out people an open door policy that they could become the sons of the living God, that they would have this time period that we currently live in with Holy Spirit sealed up in them as children, that they would be seated with that Holy Spirit and sealed with that Holy Spirit, and that they were going to become part of the cure, part of the uh, cure or the restoration of things. Uh, in Acts chapter 2, I don't want to start too. Yeah, I did. I started, I already gave the definition. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost arrived, and that word arrived is fully, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as the fire appeared to each to, to appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with Holy Spirit as the text. There's no article the and began to speak in other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. Now, I want you to think about what we went over in the last section with the dividing of the nations. Because you had a division of the nations, you had a confusion of languages. Here you have a, <laughs> a dividing of tongues and a gathering or a, uh, what's, what's the opposite of division? Uh, an adding of a people to where uh, they're, they're being brought together. I'll read on and then we'll go over it. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from what? Every nation under heaven. This is so beautiful the way Luke writes this. And at, the, at the, this sound, the multitude came together and they were what? They were bewildered. They were bewildered. They were, they were confused. Because each of them heard them speaking in his own language. The mir a lot of people miss this on the miracle of Pentecost. The fact that those tongues, which by definition are a language that the person speaking doesn't speak or nor understand. Read Corinthians. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14 and what it says about speaking in tongues. It's it's amazing. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And it goes on to list the geographic area of those native natives. And now these are Jews, understand this, but they're also proselytes. But they're Jews that have been scattered abroad during the time of uh, uh, Jeremiah the prophet when and Daniel the prophet when they were taken captive into all the surrounding nations when Jerusalem. So these are they were all there for the day of Pentecost. That was one of the required feasts that your all the men, all the women, all the children, all the slaves, all the all the. Uh, Everybody that was associated with the Jewish religion, if you will, the Jewish culture, the Jewish nation. Jews are a nation also. Don't forget, this, the word applies to Jerusalem. They are God's nation, his, his inheritance, his portion that he called out in the Hebrew writings.
but they were all required to be there. So you've got this wonderful day of Pentecost, and when it had fully come, the significance of this are so overwhelming in so many different ways, but a lot of people miss out on the similarities to what we looked at in the last session. The English Standard Version says, uh, uh, when the Most High, in verse 32.8 that we read last uh, week, uh, out of Deuteronomy, talking about the Genesis 10 account, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind and fixed borders, fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Remember that from last week. Well, this in the Septuagint, this is the same word in the Greek as what we're using here with the dividing of the tongues to the twelve. Also, this word bewildered is, is the same, come let us go down and there confound their language. Well, the bewilderment here that Luke, I think very, very purposefully, the words he chose to write this, uh, back in Genesis 10, they were bewildered because of the separation. Here they're bewildered, but when Peter stands up, he clarifies all of it, what's going on as far as what the Lord Jesus Christ had accomplished. Also, the geographic area that we looked at with the dividing of the nations, the 70 nations, the, that's the same geographic area that all these Jews were coming back in from the, uh, the, the Jews that were scattered abroad during the time of Daniel, were coming back into Jerusalem for that feast they would have been coming from all of these same geographic areas. So there's a lot of very, very strong symbolism in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost fully come, that ties directly into a reversal of the division that took place during the Hebrew writings. You see God in this amazing outpouring. This, it's just the very beginning of what would come to be known in Ephesians as the sacred secret because they were, it would take them the next 35 years to, to realize what God had accomplished. And it's almost like a comma or a, a parenthesis because nobody saw this coming. There's nowhere you can find this in the Hebrew writings. It was hidden God. So God opens up this time period where he's going to call out sons of God from all the ends of the earth, which is part of Jesus Christ's commandment in <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 16, I'm sorry, it's not one, it's one six, not one sixteen. So then they had come together. They asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time? They were looking for that restoration to Israel, the kingdom of Israel being brought to <coughs> full fruition. That's what they expected from the Messiah after he was raised from the dead. Excuse me. And he said to them, no, it's not for you to know the time of the season that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's very interesting because if you look at the details of that, not even the Son knows when he's coming back to do this thing. But, but in contrast, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. This is the inauguration for the new church straight from the Lord before he ascended. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and, to, and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Picture, you know, their, their idea of earth isn't like our idea of earth. It was very limited, very flat and had a dome. Uh, but, but nevertheless, the words have meaning here. 
this this idea of expanding the the witness of a resurrected man, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the promise seed of Genesis 3.15, is being inaugurated here. We have it in Matthew 28 also. Uh, it says that we're supposed to make disciples of all men. And that was the, the inauguration after Jesus Christ raised from the dead. I don't know, I don't know exactly when Jesus Christ got it or how much of it he got. But after he was raised from the dead, we did a, a session a number of months ago on the 40 days that he spent here on earth. Things changed. His attitude and everything changed. His perspective changed. And I believe it's because God showed him this time period and that he was going to have many sons and daughters come out of the accomplishments of Jesus Christ. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, take off, NASA. And a cloud took him out of their sight while they were just gazing to heaven. And as he went, behold, the two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from, from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. He's coming back, folks. He's coming back to gather together this group of people that he inaugurated on that day. Now, it wasn't until before Acts chapter 7, when we see the, the Enoch, uh, uh, this whole process was mainly to Jews, to the, the people of God. We even read last week in Acts chapter 3 when Peter is addressing it. Peter has a very limited knowledge about, at that time period, about what is actually happening here because he's still speaking very Jewish <laughs> as the understanding of what God actually accomplished in Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost began to progressively unfold. We see them, we see the bigger picture. But these people were human, and they were just like you and me. I mean, it's not like uh, uh, they plugged in the port of the back of their neck, and all of a sudden they were downloaded with all the information that they needed. They grew and came to understand truth, just like you have grown in your life and have come to understand truth. Life is a progressive revelation unfolding. but. Here in Acts 26, Paul is reiterating to King Agrippa his event that took place some uh, 23 or 24 years earlier when he was confronted by Jesus Christ on the road to uh, uh, Damascus. And you have to look at all these accounts where this uh, Acts chapter 9 time is brought up in the book of Acts because each one of them gives you different perspectives and different parts of actually what happened to Paul during this time period. But when you're reading Acts chapter uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, there is a huge thing of change going on there because they're finally getting to the uttermost parts of the world. They're finding, finally realizing that this word is not just for the Jewish nation, that God is calling people out from every nation. And it's illustrated here in the communication that Jesus Christ had with Paul. In verse 12 of Acts 26, it says, On one of these journeys I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, King Agrippa, I was on the road. I saw the light from heaven, brighter than the sun, a blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goats. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up 
and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. Now get this, listen to this. Paul was part of the dispersion. Paul was from Tarsus. Now he was a Jew's Jew. He was on Jews Who magazine. I mean, he was a, he sat under the feet of Gamaliel. He was very educated and very dedicated to his religion. But nevertheless, he was part of the dispersion. He was from Tarsus. That's why he could claim Roman citizenship when, when there was persecution set up against him. It kind of helped get him out of trouble. But listen to 17. It says, I will rescue you from your own people. That's the Jews. Anytime you see the people or the people of God, it's usually talking about the Jews. And from the Gentiles. I am sending, I'm rescuing you from them and I'm sending you to them. Why? Why are you sending them to them? To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now this, this thing is power packed. And uh, this, is, this is my Galatians thing, John, by the way. <laughs> in Galatians 3.26, we realize, and, and again, this writing would have come after this time period, not before Acts 26, but before Acts 9. And um, in Galatians, the unfolding of this is even more prevalent because in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it says, this is Paul writing years later after uh, this meeting with Jesus. So in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is significant, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, you got to read the text. You are children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, I don't see, uh, I have a problem with this baptism with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because I never see him do it. I don't have a problem with the text. I think, I actually think that that's what the text reads in Matthew 28. They were baptized in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I think that's manipulative. And, but they were baptized, the Father God, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit is, is prevalent if you understand them as separate beings, not as a trinity. It doesn't say anything about a trinity in there. But I, I do understand that commissioning. But at the same time, that is a, that's a commissioning to, be, to go out and do exactly what we see Paul being told to do here. I just Every time I read it in the book of Acts, it just says you're baptized into Christ. Having clothed yourself with Christ, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither free, slave or free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This calling out from among all of these different groups that lists here, but primarily in the Hebrew writings, it's the nations of the world, including the Jewish nation, that's all bunk now. That stuff doesn't matter. God is calling people out from every quadrant into this birth, into this fellowship. And this is so cool, especially the way it leads in 28. In verse 29, it says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Now, it's not talking about you being Israel. This is silly. The text builds upon Abraham's seed. It's talking about you being Christ. The promised seed that Abraham saw was the Messiah. What he didn't see is that that singular seed was going to have a whole group of people that it would affect. He just saw the Messiah, the coming one. And because you are of that seed, singular, of the same seed of Christ, the promised seed of Israel, you are of the same seed, then you are heirs according to the promise. Well, heirs with who? It's heirs with Christ according to Romans 8. We're going to look at that hard today. 
heirs of God with Christ. Nobody saw that coming in the Hebrew writings. And this calling that Paul's getting here, it's the this word rescue is tied together with these two X. The word rescue here is ek serio. And it, it is literally means I am I'm completely taking you out. Ek hernermio, which is personal choice of preference, so properly to be removed completely from. And it's double emphasized with these other two X. I'm completely removing from your you from your own from your people from the Jews, and I'm completely removing you from the Gentiles. It's not a rescue like I mean, we see Paul getting beat up so much that we tend to think, oh, God's going to rescue you. God promised to rescue me, and he rescues him every time. Well, <clears throat> I can see that point, but that's not what it's saying here. It is I'm completely taking you out. I'm taking you out, ek, from your own people, and out, ek, from the Gentiles, and I'm sending you to them. This... I love these banners that people wear on their wrist. What would Jesus do? Well, that's I, I don't, I'm not saying that we shouldn't think about what Jesus would do, but we also should look, what would Paul do? The life of Paul gives the illustration of what each one of us go through individually. God has completely rescued you, completely taken you out from both your religious background and your national background, and he sends you back to them. I'm sending you back to them. Why? Why are you sending us back? I don't want to go back. Uh, it's crazy back there. To open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That is how we perform that inauguration. This body of Christ that is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, but all one in Christ, that seed of promise that's been put in each individual one of you have called you together into a body of Christ to be taken out. And again, I'm gathering that I'm speaking mostly to Gentiles. But if you're a Jew, it fits because it's just another nation now taking you out from among the nations of the world to send you back to them. In Romans 16, 25, we have another illustration of the mystery tied into this idea. <clears throat> now unto him who is able to strengthen you. I love the bookends of Romans. They're so beautiful. We're going to look at Romans 1. There's an exact quote here as there is in Romans 1. Now unto him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel, Paul. Talk about, Paul, oh, oh, I don't want you to take this thing so too personal. Well, Paul took it very personal. My gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. If they're not preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, you're going to have a limited fellowship with them because they don't understand the sacred secret, the administration of the sacred secret, then you're going to have a limited fellowship with them. And that is, that ha, that was kept secret for long ages. God held this in himself. Nobody knew until Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, and then he knew, and part of the church epistles is him pouring it out to his wonderful body that are getting on board, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known. What prophetic writings? Not the Hebrew writings. There's no inkling anywhere, not in the Gospels before the resurrection. There's no inkling to this anywhere. <laughs> it's talking about the prophetic writings that they, these guys were writing, including this Peter says people are having a whole hard time with Paul's writings because they're for them, for them, for the people, they're hard to understand as they distort all the scriptures. Peter calls Paul's writings scriptura, scriptures. Uh, but 
to the prophetic writings, it's got to be the, the Christian prophetic writings, has been made known to all what? Nations, according to the command of the eternal God. We see this command being given to Paul from through the mouth of Jesus Christ to bring about the obedience of what? Faith. The trust that we have been brought into. The only wise God <laughs> be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. So we've got this wonderful bookend in Romans that, that sums up a lot of what we're talking. It's being made known to the nations. It's not bringing, some of the translations have uh, to bring the nations into subjection. That's not happening yet, but that is a future reality. This is to bring, to be, make known to the nations for the obedience of faith, to witness the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected man, the son of the living God, and what has happened in us being made available to be saved, born again. Thank you. So you've got this calling going out to where? All the nations. Why? To bring people out, to show them what has been made available. Romans chapter 1 has the exact same wording in the opening. Uh, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets. The gospel of God, the good news of God, coming from his prophets. That's where Romans starts. The Hebrew writings in the Holy Scriptures. Well, what did the Hebrew writings write about? Concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh who was declared the Son of God with power by his resurrection out from among the dead, it should be, according to the spirit of holiness. So you've got these two births of Jesus Christ in the flesh and in the spirit, resurrection. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith among all the Gentiles, for his namesake. The we is just us <laughs> among whom you, <laughs> in case you were wondering, also are called of Jesus Christ. This is the announcement. The Hebrew writings only showed Jesus. It takes all of Romans to get you from that one seed to the many. 2 Corinthians 3 4 says, such is the confidence we have <laughs> uh, through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from who? God. Now listen to this, because this, this, this thing is used to try to tell people that we're in a covenant, and we're not, but we do have a future <clears throat> vision of what not what are we now we're calling people out from all the nations we have the ministry of reconciliation corinthians said we're calling everybody out to bear witness jesus is the son of the living god is bringing many sons and daughters into the fold he's going to have a whole group why because he is making us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant not now that's in the future when we come back to the earth with to get Israel. They will not get in without us. God has decided to do it that way. Not of the letter. Where did the letter come from? The law, Moses, of the Hebrew writings, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death, the letter, the law, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory. God, it was I mean, Moses, holy cow, he's talking about Jews who or who's Jew magazine. He's, he's always in the cover. And uh, that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was, bring, which was being brought to an end. That glory is, was dying out. Uh, that covenant, they couldn't keep it up. That covenant is fading away. It's not gone. It's fading away, the word says. 
Verse 8, will not the ministry of the Spirit, this grace administration, have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, that's what the law did, thou shalt not. I <laughs> kept things in line until the sun would come. The ministry of righteousness must be far exceeding in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. We are we're not, we're not replacing Israel. We are the sons of God that are bringing in the new covenant. We are the examples of what God really wants because of the glory that, was, that, that has surpassed it. For if what, what was being brought in, brought to an end, the law, with glory, much more will be what is permanent, everlasting life, have glory. Since we have such a what? Future, folks. This is, <laughs> get hope. Who hopes for what they already have? This covenant relationship is future, and we're bringing it. Since we have such a hope, we see this in front of us. We're very bold. We're very confident through Christ Jesus. This is hope. This is what's going to happen in the future. This whole context is talking about the bringing in of the ministry <coughs> of the new covenant, which doesn't happen until after the tribulation <coughs> period. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, and let's read a little bit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, plural, the plurality is important, the body of Christ, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world my question is before the foundations of what world <laughs> the one from the beginning or the one in the future that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. Now we have a token, but it's sealed. It's a seal. You coming into your full sonship is guaranteed. He's predestined you for that. He's predestined you for adoptions to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, the beloved Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, with, with which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us it says the mystery of his will. It should be the secret of his will. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for when? The fullness of time. And uh, uh, most of the text is talking about the, it's the administration of the fullness of time. The, the plan, they're trying to do that because of stewardship instead of uh, Oikonomia administration, the administration of the fullness of time, a specific time period. Another uh, uh, section in God's overall time period, the, the overall chronos of God. We are in the grace administration. This is the administration of the fullness of time. It's really the only two that are used in those terms. What is he going to do in the administration of the fullness of time? to unite all things in him, things in heaven, where these sons of God and all these spiritual beings are, and things on earth. That's the, that's the purpose 
over the long run. This administration thing, I pulled up the uh, Greek lexicon uh, just so you could see that this is oikonomia for the administration of the fullness of time to bring together the things, the all things in Christ, the things in heaven and the things upon the earth. <clears throat> this is a, you've got to see this. What's he, what's he predestined us to? He's predestined us to this future administration, the time of the fullness of time. That's what we, that's what we're getting set up to do. In reality, today we're being called out from the nations and from uh, the religious organizations and going back to those nations to call more people out, to get more people on board, to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, when we come back with the Lord Jesus Christ, after our gathering together into him at the end of the tribulation period, we're coming back to help take over those nations and literally to bring those nations into obedience. That uh, now we're taking people out. He's taking people out of the very nations he's going to send them back to. The things in heaven, we are in the heavenlies. We, uh, we have a heavenly responsibility in the future concerning that future administration. The people on earth, the earthly responsibility belongs to Israel. Their promise the land. Our promise is God himself. We are his inheritance. Uh, we, are, we will serve him day and night in order to be <laughs> sons of God in a manner that the original sons of God should have been in the first place, but they couldn't cut it. And that's where we're going with these teachings. Sons of God are mentioned uh, throughout the Christian and the Hebrew writings. Uh, in Job chapter 1, 6, it says, Now there, are, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with among them. <clears throat> now this word Satan is distinguished out, and we know from the story of Job that he was questioning Job's loyalty. It's the Satan here that we see projected isn't the same ideal that we know the devil of today. The progressive, this character progressively unfolds. It's like we talked about with everything else. When Job was here, this character was who he was. Uh, it, I mean, uh, but it progressively unfolds. Evil progressively gets worse and worse and uglier and uglier. Goodness of God gets unbelievably greater and greater and more vast. Job 38, it talks about a much earlier time. It talks about during the time of creation. It's a reiteration. Job is getting a pop quiz and he didn't study. God is asking him, okay, Job, you're, you guys are so smart. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I set its borders? By the time we get to 38, 70, he says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is, a, uh, this is how many of the sons of God shouted for joy? This is a time of united purpose with all the sons of God. No strife, no division. And it's really cool here to see this Hebrew double. St morning stars, sons of God. The, the morning stars are, are identifying themselves as the sons of God. But we see in the scriptures a lot of times stars being referred to as angelic spiritual beings. But we, when you go through the scriptures and you see this, uh, this, this, I forget the name of it. It's a double, a double meaning, a double word for the same meaning. These things are called; these beings are called morning stars. The significance of morning star is the first thing you see. The first thing you see in the rising of the light. The morning stars all sang together. This is a time of harmony and, and togetherness where God is creating this barah, this beautiful, beautiful heaven and earth. He's going to make a place for his man on here. And all his spiritual beings are in unity with him. All the sons of God shouted for joy. From the time you get to Psalms 82, verse 6 and 7, it says, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. Fall like princes. 
Remember we read that section in Deuteronomy? God doesn't like it when people go against him and try to defeat his purpose of goodness and with evil. And that there's going to be repercussions for that. Well, by the time we get to the writing of Psalms 82, 6 and 7, there's judgment being pronounced among some of these sons of God. Not all of them. Like it says, not all of them. But there's some bad ones that are being consistently bad up to this point. I mean, uh, you got to read some of these Psalms. So I got Psalms 89, 6 in here just to illustrate the sons of the mighty. Because this terminology is throughout the Hebrew and Christian writings. For who in the sky is, compar is comparable to Yahweh? Who among the sons of the mighty is like Yahweh? None of them are like Yahweh. They're his created beings. <laughs> That's like the Ford trying to explain Henry. or be. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's part of his, what he made. These sons of God are, were made by God. None of them can, they can gee, Yahweh, he's, he is the originator. And then we get to Romans 8, 19, and we're actually going to read through this to close out today so that we can pick this up next week. And I want to go to the scriptures to read this. Romans chapter 8, 19 is a very cool section of scripture. It uh, talks a lot about what we have been talking about. Uh, and I just want to read through this to close out today. I'm going to read it in the NAS. And you can read along if you like. I'll blow it up a little bit for you. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the Not law... Yes, uh, it, you know, we're still on the sons of God screen. It didn't come up to Romans 8, 1. Thank you very much. New share. Let's see what we got here. How can I make this work? Let's try this. What sayeth thou? Did that fix it? Yeah, that's got it now. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you, John. So, verse 2, for the, what, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. In other words, you don't have to fulfill it, it's already you took Christ on, so you took everything he accomplished on. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind sets, for the mind sets on the flesh, the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on flesh is hostility toward God, for it does not subject itself to the laws of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him, God. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus out from among, it should be, the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, again, with all this stuff, there is an immediate availability, but there's also a long term because 
that spirit of life is going to be what either changes your current living body or raises to life you in the new body if you have, if you already die before the lord returns verse 12 so then brother we are not under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh for if you are living according to the flesh you must die but if by the flesh you are putting to death the deeds of the body excuse me but if by the spirit if by the spirit you are putting to death what did i say by the flesh <laughs> If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are what? Sons of God. You are very, very unique in who you are in Christ Jesus. For you have not received a spirit of slavery. We're going to look at this real deep in the next session, exactly why it's the spirit of slavery and who the slaveholders are. A spirit of slavery leading to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which you cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, test of the Spirit himself, I, I can prove that the text is talking specifically about Jesus Christ and his lordly lordly function to the body the spirit himself testifies with our spirit we have spirit to spirit communication um that's better than it's got to be better than t-mobile because i get dropped all the time i don't get dropped here spirit himself testifies with our spirit about what that we are ch the children of god this is this is what we're <laughs> this is the this is what we're supposed to be teaching. There's, the Lord is alive and well, and what's he doing? He's bringing many children into the fold. And as children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. You can't find that in the Hebrew writings. If indeed we suffer with him, part of the plan after you are saved, you're saved, so now what? Is as you endure, as you work, as you do the good that you are called and you are now capable of doing, that going through that suffering in this present time with him, that we may also be glorified with him. You're rewarded in the future. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. <laughs> you think you're having fun now. You wait till the rewards. For the anxious longing of creation. Now, creation is being used as a figure because creation doesn't have anxious longing, but the beings in creation do. The anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, plural. <clears throat> this is all since the day of Pentecost. Nobody knew this was going to happen. It was a secret. For the creation was subject to futility. Not willingly. They didn't go into it willing. It just it happened because of some of the beings started destroying stuff and brought evil into the picture. One particular. It'll be as above. It'll be crushed under our feet. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it period uh, who is subjected to it? the devil the evil one in hope we in hope the hope that we have been given is that creation itself also will be set free what why are they waiting for the manifestations of sons of god because we are leading the way into the freedom from the slavery that creation has been brought in with one head, Jesus Christ, uh, from the from its slavery to the corruption. Remember the what Paul? What what, if Paul, what are we doing now? We're setting people free 
We're, we're, we're telling them about Jesus Christ and that they can get saved and born again and become sons of the Most High God. We're setting them free. Ultimately, we're going to help. We're going to play a part in setting all of creation free from the bondage and corruption. That's what it says here. Verse 21, that creation itself also will be set free from the slavery to the corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans. Oh, God, you ever groan? With the way things are going on, well, creation groans and suffers in pain of childbirth together until now. Why? Because they see the secret, the part of God's plan, part of the plan that's going to help to bring into that new covenant, to take over this planet, to do things the way God wants them done for a thousand years, and ultimately setting up an everlasting kingdom whose builder and maker is God himself. And not only this, but we and ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. Well, you, that's going to come to life when, you, when we get into the book of Revelation. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons. Well, we just read that in Romans. We're adopted as sons. When does it? I thought we were sons. So when does this take place? What's the adoption to sons? The terminology is always in association with the redemption of our bodies. Right now you have this life in this corrupt, mortal, limited body. In the future, you're going to have a body like Jesus. Think about that. You're going to see him as he is. We're going to be like him, First John says. For in hope, in this hope, in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. For who hopes for what he already sees? Think about those scriptures we went through today about the hope. But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait for it eagerly. It keeps us going on the current focus. What's the current focus? To be witnesses, to disciple people, to get people on board, to free them from their current slavery. In the same way, the Spirit, Jesus. <laughs> Show you it's Jesus here in a minute. The Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. And He who searches the hearts, God knows what's in the mind of His Son. They're, they're united. Knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because He, the Spirit, intercedes for the saints, or actually to the saints. In accordance with God's will. The text is, he comes to these to us, and he keeps us on the mark. That's what the text is. He intercedes. He, he keeps us in alignment and harmony. He keeps us straight with God. Like that go to God and intercede. That's you've got a misconception of the meaning of that word. He comes to us. Verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together. Again, God is working for the good. And all these things, that's the context. God has not done cause all things to work together for good. There's bad out there. God is always working for the good in all things. Uh, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now here is... This context is beautiful because it shows that God had this plan before, this foreknowing. He knew he was going to get to this time period. He didn't foreknow you or me individually until we were born. And then and he didn't know we were going to be predestined until he called us. Because we had to accept. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. Look at this. Those who he foreknew, the group. He also predestined the people that would actually accept this to, be, to become conformed to the image of his son. This predestined is the same predestined that's used in Ephesians. It's not talking about that we are predestined from before the foundation of the world. 
not that world. We were predestined before the foundation of the world. We're going to, to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. So that he would be the first among many brothers. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these who he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> That's a pretty awesome statement when you really think about it. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him, his son, freely give us all things? Who will bring charges against God's elect? God is the one who justified us. Who is the one who will condemn us? Is it Christ Jesus? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who as at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. <clears throat> Intertecamo is the same word that we read about the Spirit. Jesus Christ in his powerful form is often referred to as the spirit in the christian writings who will separate us from the love of christ will tribulation distress persecution famine nakedness of sword we're going to go through these things <laughs> chances are if you're speaking the word you get, there's there's some i mean we have tough times but is it going to separate us from the love of christ i don't think so just as it written as it is written for your sakes we are being put to death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us for i am convinced that neither death nor life nor angel nor principality nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depth nor any other created thing Ooh. Will be this is I mean when we, when we tear this open next week with this these created things will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we get back next week, we're going to pick it up with uh, this section, uh, look at some of the other context here, uh, and actually start looking at these principalities and powers and exactly what jesus christ was set above as the risen man of god uh, that uh, adam was not uh was was not subject to adam originally the original <coughs> adam the first adam but is subject to the second adam because of his accomplishments so father god i thank you for your word I thank you for this time of sharing it. I hope it helps anybody. I mean, I just hope that, that it blesses people and, and moves them along and helps them just get one step closer to your wonderful majesty. And in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. That's what I got. I did okay? Yep. Okay, well, there's just not enough time to do a fellowship after hours again. So we'll just skip it. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.